Welcome everyone to the Apotheki Tales, the basics of pharmacology. In this video, we're going to learn about the neurotransmission in the CNS, with which we can learn more about the treatment strategies that can be used in the treatment of the various neurodegenerative diseases, which we'll be learning in the coming videos. So let's just get started with the neurotransmission in this video. So most of the drugs that affect the central nervous system is acting by altering some steps in the neurotransmission process. So if you observe a neuron junction, so there will be a postsynaptic neuron as well as a presynaptic neuron. So presynaptic neuron is the first neuron uh, that is before the uh, synapse and the postsynaptic neuron is the one following the synapse. So in the uh, how does this drugs act is that either they will act presynaptically by influencing the production, storage, release or termination of action of the neurotransmitters or else they act by activating or blocking the postsynaptic receptors. So when you talk about the neurotransmission in the CNS, in many ways the basic functioning of neurons in the CNS is similar to that of the autonomic nervous system. For instance, if you observe, the transmission of information in both the CNS as well as in the periphery involves the release of neurotransmitters that will diffuse across the synaptic space to bind to the specific receptors that is present in the postsynaptic neuron. And in the both systems, the recognition of the neurotransmitter by the membrane receptor of the postsynaptic neuron will trigger certain intracellular changes. But there are several major differences existing between the neurons in the peripheral ANS as well as in the CNS. If we observe, the circuitry of the CNS is much more complex than that of the ANS and the number of synapses in the CNS is far greater. The CNS, unlike the peripheral ANS, contains the powerful network of inhibitory neurons that are constantly active in modulating the rate of neuronal transmission. In addition to this, the CNS is communicating through the use of multiple neurotransmitters, whereas the ANS uses only two primary neurotransmitters, those are the acetylcholine and the norepinephrine. Now, when you talk about the synaptic potentials, so what it is? In the CNS, receptors at most synapses are coupled to certain ion channels. So what happens when the neurotransmitter binds to the postsynaptic membrane receptors? It will cause a rapid but transient opening of these ion channels. Opening the channels will allow the specific ions inside or outside the cell membrane to flow down their concentration gradient. That means it will flow from the highest concentration to the lowest concentration. The resulting change in the ionic composition across the membrane of the neuron alters the postsynaptic potential producing either the depolarization or hyperpolarization of the postsynaptic membrane depending on the specific ions and direction of their movement. So what happens? First when the neurotransmitter comes and acts on their respective receptors, the ion channels get open and this will cause the movement of the ions either outward or inward depending upon their concentration gradient hence produces particular action. Now there are two types of pathways that is excitatory pathways and in inhibitory pathways. So the neurotransmitters can be classified as either excitatory or inhibitory depending on the nature of the action they elicit. Now talking about the excitatory pathways, stimulation of the excitatory neurons causes a movement of ions that results in depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane. So what happens is that if there is no uh, agonist or no particular uh, neurotransmitter acting on the receptor, there is no opening of the channels and no entry. Whereas the excitatory postsynaptic potential that is EPSP are usually generated by the following method that is stimulation of an excitatory neuron causes the release of the neurotransmitter molecules such as glutamate or acetylcholine which will bind to the receptors on the postsynaptic cell membrane. And this will cause a transient increase in the permeability of the sodium ion. So what happens when the acetylcholine or respective neurotransmitter comes and binds to the, the receptor, this will cause the increase in permeability of the sodium channel. 
This will cause the influx of sodium causing a weak depolarization or the excitatory postsynaptic potentials that moves the postsynaptic potential toward its firing threshold that is more of excitation. If the number of the stimulated excitatory neurons increases more excitatory neurotransmitter is released. This ultimately causes the EPSP depolarization of the postsynaptic cell to pass a threshold, thereby generating an all or none action potential. So you have to keep in mind is that the generation of a nerve impulse typically reflects the activation of the synaptic receptors by thousands of excitatory neurotransmitter molecules released from many nerve fibers. So that is all about the excitatory pathways. Next, when you talk about the inhibitory pathways, the stimulation of the inhibitory neurons causes movement of ions that results in hyperpolarization. So, in excitatory, it was depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane, whereas in inhibitory pathways, it is hyperpolarization of the postsynaptic membrane. So, when there is no agonist acting on the receptor, the channels are closed. For instance, it is the chloride channel, so that remains closed and no potential changes will occur. But whereas the stimulation of this inhibitory neurons is associated with the inhibitory postsynaptic potential that is IPSP which is generated as follows that is stimulation of the inhibitory neurons will release the neurotransmitter molecules such as the GABA or glycine which will bind to the respective receptors that is present on the postsynaptic cell membrane. This will cause a transient increase in the permeability of specific ions such as potassium or chloride and the influx of chloride and efflux of potassium causes a weak hyperpolarization. So keep in mind, so what happens in hyperpolarization, both the potassium and chloride channels will get opened and this causes the influx of the chloride and efflux of the potassium causing a weak hyperpolarization or IPSP that moves the postsynaptic potential away from its firing threshold. So what happens here it is inhibition happening. That means this IPSP will cause the postsynaptic potential to move away from its firing threshold. This diminishes the generation of the action potential. There are instances in which combined effects of the EPSP and IPSP occur. So most neurons in the CNS receive both this EPSP and IPSP input. The several different types of neurotransmitters may act on the same neuron but each binds to its own specific receptor. So we had already mentioned CNS means there is multiple neurotransmitters acting and thereby it receives both the EPSP and IPSP input. And the overall action is a summation of the individual actions of the various neurotransmitters on the neuron. The neurotransmitters are not uniformly distributed in the CNS but are localized in specific clusters of neurons, the axons of which may synapse with specific regions of the brain. And many neuronal tracts that seem to be chemically coded and this may offer greater opportunity for selective modulation of certain neuronal pathways. Now talking about the neurodegenerative diseases such as the Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. These devastating illnesses are characterized by the progressive loss of selected neurons in discrete brain areas resulting in characteristic disorders of movement, cognition or both. And in our coming videos, we'll be talking about the different treatment strategies used in these neurodegenerative diseases. So I hope in this video, you have clearly understood regarding the neurotransmission, the synaptic potentials uh, present in the brain. And if there's any doubts and comments, please do mail in us. Thank you.